Hello everybody and welcome to a new student's final project presentations ceremony. Today we have two very exciting presentations but two students that have recently finished their final projects. First one is going to be related to uh, manipulation arm to the Starbucks cafeteria and second one it's a brand new project based on a tic-tac-toe uh, game. So uh, yeah, they are going to be super excited. Then uh, as always, please, if you have any questions for the students, uh, share them in the YouTube channel so that we can make them to, to the students. And uh, yeah, just enjoy. So we are going to start with the first presentation by Andres uh, Alamo. His presentation is titled Automated Coffee Delivery Using Movie 2 and YOLO B5. You can see him already here in the screen. So uh, yeah, hello, Andres. Are you ready for your presentation? There, all right. Hello, hello, Andres. Hi, Alberto. Can you hear me? Okay, Everyone. I think I was muted here in Zoom and you didn't hear the introduction. So, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. So, uh, yeah, I have just presented your project which okay. is titled Automated Coffee Delivery, Delivery Using Movie 2 and YOLO B5. It sounds super interesting. So, uh, yeah, it's all yours. Okay. Give me a moment while... Okay. I will start my project and give me a moment to share my screen. Yeah, okay. we can see your screen. Okay. Send. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, let's start talking about coffee and robotics. Do you know that coffee is the second most famous drink around the world? Yes, that's an amazing fact, right? Well, let's see this graph provided by Statista, where it's about the cup of coffee consumed per capita on average in a year. Well, here we have the top 10 coffee drinks nations in that year, and we can analyze that at least one, one cup of coffee is drinked per day by a person. And in some cases, more than three cups of coffee are drinked. Uh, and I mentioned this because I want you to imagine the business of a coffee shop and observe that there are a large number of coffees that must be sold during a day. But we realize that it is a repetitive task that tires workers. Therefore, this task can be automated. Uh, so let me tell you the vision of an automated coffee shop. Well, first, through an application, a person orders his coffee. Second, a robot arm moves the cup of coffee served to a mobile robot with cup holder holes. And third, a mobile robot delivers the cups of coffee to the final customers. Uh, the scope of my project was the first and the second part. So I am happy to introduce to you Starbucks coffee delivery. Well, uh, let's see a video that shows how the real robot uh, works on this cafeteria, which is placed in Barcelona. Well, I want to mention that the video is at double speed. Uh, you can see a UR3 robot arm uh, from Universal Robots delivering a cup of coffee to this mobile robot, which is a barista robot. Well, let me explain uh, the environment where the robot is working. And you can see here is the robot, the robot arm on a table. And if you could notice here, there is an X mark 
with black tape. Well, this is a fixed point and I want you to remember this because this is the place where the robot will pick up the coffee every time. And the robot moves to this side, but here the robot doesn't know where is the, the where to place the cup. And for that reason, this project uses an Intel RGBD camera in order to perform 3D perception and detect if there is or not a hole. So the content I will be presenting during the presentation first is the things I launched in ROS2 because this project uh, was done in ROS2 Humble. Uh, then I'm going to go deeper into two important topics, which are perception and manipulation. And finally, we are going to see uh, demonstrations. So let's see the things I launched in ROS2. I launched four things. The first is the movie setup, where it is the UR3 configuration. Uh, there I set the proper URDF file of the robot and also set the proper controllers. Uh, the second launch is related to the perception and it is using YOLO E5. Well, I grow there two nodes. The first for cap detection and it is using YOLO V5. And the second is a TF publisher where there is a hole. Uh, the third launch is related to manipulation. It uses Movie 2 and I grow a service server in C++ and I am using the move group interface to command the robot action. And the last launch is related to the web. There I am using Foxglobe. Well, uh, the thing I launched uh, is the, a Foxglobe bridge, which basically takes the topic, the to all the topics of the robot and expose them to the web. And, and then from the other side, I open a tab in my browser and I go to foxglobe.dev in order to open the website I prepare and connect to, to the robots in order to monitor and control the application. Well, let's explain in depth what was done in Perception. Uh, first, I collected several images from the simulation. And well, second, I labeled these images using this software, uh, this program uh, named Label Studio, which is available in GitHub. And after labeling the images, I export them in the YOLO V5 format. Here you can see that uh, there is only one label. I, I decided that it's whole, only whole. And also I want that you observe this, that holes are the features that determines a hole is the shape of a circle. So it is not a complex task for a convolutional neural network. For that reason, I decided to use the YOLO V5 small model. Uh, the third step was following the steps provided by a YOLO V5 repo repository and uh, do the training of the of the YOLO model. After that, I obtained the metrics, the results, and you can see here that the precision and recall uh, had very good values. They are almost one, and the combination of, of both metrics are the mean average precision, uh, which is almost one, and it means that the, the model uh, is very accurate. And here you can see the detections. And here um, the holes are identified are identified correctly and with a high confidence value. So at the end I make a copy of the weights of this training for the next part which is the first node I wrote in, in ROS. It is uh, the cup detection, 
this node subscribes to two topics, the RGB image and the depth image. Uh, in the RGB image, the, model, the YOLO model performs the whole detection, as you can see here. And you can see that sometimes uh, there are several detections. In that case, I, I am taking just the first detection in order to do the following. Well, I will have the, the information of the box. So I am, um, I am interesting on the center because it is the center of the hole. So I have an X and Y position in pixels. And then um, I will apply these values on these formulas. I will explain in a moment that. And so here I have X and Y, right? These are the center. And I am looking here for the value in the depth image. I, I go to X and Y and, and get this value, and it is called depth. Um, here you can see the formulas for determining the position of an object detection using an RGBD camera. And here you can see, you might be asking yourself what are CX, CY, FX, and FY. Well, they, there are values that you can find in the, in the camera info topic and are known as intrinsic values. So at the end, I perform these operations and I got the relative position of the hole respect to the RGBD camera. So this node at the end publishes the relative position and also the result image in order to test that everything is okay. Wait, my mouse. And my second node is a TF publisher. Here, this node subscribes to the relative position and, and then it publishes the absolute position of the hole. And from, and some, and there is something else that you can see here. I am publishing the transformation. And it is because this helped me to visualize that the published X, Y, Z position of the, of the hole is correct. Mm -hmm. So now let's explain what was done in manipulation. I will mention two things that are the most important from my point of view. The first one is the sync. Uh, the sync is conformed by these objects in green that you can see here that represents uh, in these objects, in this case, the table, uh, the coffee machine, and the wall. Um, well, uh, applying this helps the robot to know which areas not to pass through. Otherwise, uh, the robot would collide, right? Uh, for that reason, um, adding these static objects help a lot. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is uh, using a constraint planning. Uh, but first, let me give you an example. Imagine that the robot starts from red point and we command the robot to move to the green point. Well, uh, when we do that, sometimes the end effect rotates and for this application it is undesirable for that reason um, fortunately the OPL planning um, provides constraint planning and these are the messages available for for the planning part for the planning method and the important for my application was the orientation constraint. So using movement with orientation constraint prevents the cap from rotating and thus preventing coffee from spilling. Uh, now I want to show you the a simulation demonstration. Here you can see that uh, the simulation is launched. Uh, here is the movie part launched. Um, 
it is, here is the displays, which is available, so it is working. This is the perception part that I show I launch. And here, um, remember that there are two nodes. Here for the Jolo detection and the second one for the TF publisher. Uh, well, it is on Arbis. Here, this is the service server. Uh, this is Fox Club, and well, you could see a button uh, that demonstrates that the service is available. Then, this is the Fox Club bridge, and in and this is the Fox Club web page where I added many tabs, panels, and controls uh, to allow me to monitor and control the application. Uh, after pressing this button, I ordered a coffee. So the robot start this task. And you will see in a moment when I change to the simulation tab. Well, I spawned in that moment a cup of coffee. So, and the robot goes to the pickup position, a, do a approach motion, grab the cup of coffee, do a retreat motion, and then it rotate, rotates through this axis. And finally, you can see that here, um, the, the position of the hole is already known. For that reason, at the end, the robot performs the movement with orientation constraint to move over the hole. Then the cap is released. And finally, the robot arm returns to its home position. And now I want to show you that um, the perception is running continuously. And it's, um, that can be demonstrated because it is updated. Yes, this is the new cup of coffee and here are the the holes available and what you see here is the part of the point cloud so let's see the robot delivering the coffee live i will move oh, to the Construct platform in a moment. So here are the reference of my presentation. And thanks for your attention. Um, now I will share all my screen, the whole screen. Mm -hmm. Alberto, can you see my... Um, we see your browser now. Yes. As I mentioned before, well, I have the problem. Ah, the, it has logged out. Yes. Okay. So... Okay, okay. So we have to wait about 10 minutes. Oh. oh. Or no. Give me a moment. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Um, no, there is no problem. We will okay, uh, cool. See the robot working live. Okay, okay. We uh, we, we don't see the project page, however, now. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, give me a moment. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for informing that. Um,
with the screen. Okay, mm -hmm. now now we see the Roger with the cameras and everything, yeah. Yes. Okay. Nice. Well, let me open the terminal and many tabs. I think the one. Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, this is my repository. I will launch some things. Um, first of all, I want to be sure that everything is working mm -hmm. fine in the real road. So we have to wait a little in order to check the, the topics. Mm -hmm. mm, it sometimes mm, takes 30 seconds, so it's okay. Okay. And here you can see the the stream of the lab, lab yeah. the cafeteria. This is live here in our yes, it is. facilities. Okay, let's see the robot description. Okay, everything is okay. And the and the controllers. So, Okay, it's working and let's see the controllers, if the controllers are mm -hmm. available. Um, it's here, yeah, everything is okay. So we can start um, launching the, all the parts of the robot. Well, let me name the each tab. Well, this is the movie setup. Uh, we'll put, yeah. uh, okay, move it. Then I will launch the perception, then the manipulation, but remember it's a service. So let's start launching, move it. Then, um, well, I need to export the, I am using a virtual environment, so you found this, this is necessary. Oh. Why is that? Um, well, uh, is I am exporting the the Python palette of my virtual environments, and then I, I am. Is that for YOLO to... or? Uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I decided to use a virtual environment mm -hmm. in order to uh, don't lose uh, the yeah the packages the that libraries because yeah. well the computers. Uh, we can say that erase the installations. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, for that reason, I it um, for that reason I decided to mm -hmm. to have the libraries inside my my package. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a good a good solution. Yes, um, for that reason I start my virtual environment and finally um, I will start the. Perception. We have to wait a little. It is loading. Yes, it is. Um, yes. Here you can see that the motion planning display is available. So this launch was completed. Uh, here, um, YOLO is launched and the detections will be available in a moment. So here I always have to wait about a minute And I will set some parameters for the, ah, it is ready. Yes, here are the detections. You can see that they are live. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to show you the service server. I will load first some parameters. And finally launch the service server. 
we will see that uh, first the scene will be loaded. Mm -hmm. Now I will install Foxglob. It is the bridge. Bridge. And here I will obtain my address. Also, let me apply the command. We have to wait a moment. And launch the the Fox Loop bridge. Let's do that. Yes, it is. Everything is okay. Um, now move to the to the dashboard in foxglobe.dep. So I will open a connection. Paste my Rosebridge address. Open the connection and wait um, a moment in order to to start the operation of the road, the delivery, delivering the coffee. Um, images are the images usually helps you to to check this if they they appear, um, everything is ready. Yes, mm -hmm. you can see here that. It's ready. So um, we can start. I will do this in order to Yes, here it is. OK. Um, so we are ready to mm -hmm. order a coffee. So I will press the button and the robot will perform the task. Uh, here, what I am doing is calling the service. Mm -hmm. And I, well, here I have feedback. I add a topic because I, I Foxlob doesn't provide actions. For that reason, I at the topic in order to have feedback. And here you can see, yes, the detections. Here the robot is moving to the, over the hole. And as you can see, at the end, I did a, uh, a change. I am doing a final approach in order to insert the cap mm -hmm. in the hole. So we can order more coffee by pressing the button. You can see that the robot will move to the to its grab position, then we'll move to the over the cup of coffee. Remember, it is a fixed point. Then open the gripper. doing the approach motion, closing the gripper, doing the retreat motion and rotating around this axis. Then the robot moves with orientation constraint and do a final motion in order to insert the cap in the hole. You can see here that the robot is rotating. It is because uh, we have some clamps here, and in order to not collide, I add two more um, objects to the scene. So we can order more coffee. <laughs> There's Wait. never, there's never Moment. too much coffee. <laughs> yeah. Mm. 
here uh, you can see that the feedback helps uh, a lot uh, because well this this fake topic because help you debug the application um it is the same and shows you the the times where things are performed yes and finally here the cap is placed in the hole and uh and check that here the the yellow detection is updated mm -hmm. I don't know if you want more coffee or it's okay. I think I think it's it's okay. <laughs> okay, if you consider we can uh, rotate a little, uh, rotate the robot or move to another position and try. Okay, if one more time. Let's see if Rodrigo can to, hear us. I if think he can... that. Oh, sorry. Let's no. continue. Yeah, yeah, I was saying, let's see if Rodrigo can hear us and he can maybe try to rotate a little bit the yes. robot. In that way, uh, I can demonstrate that the, that the that these positions are not hard-coded mm -hmm. and are... There we see Rodrigo's feet. ...are being determined by the RGBD camera. Yes. Rodrigo, yeah, I think he's going to rotate it now. There we go. Yeah, so we can see how it's okay. changing. Okay. Uh, so let's order uh, the last cup of coffee. So the robot has started. It's moving to the crap position. Let's let me describe again. Um, moves to the pickup position. And pick up the coffee. Then it rotates around this axis. And move with orientation constraint to the over the hole and do a final <laughs> movement in order to insert the cup of coffee. I hope you enjoy the, the, the live demonstration. It was a super cool demonstration, let me say. With thank everything. You. Also, somebody, somebody here in the chat is saying, thank you for introducing me to Fox Globe. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. And it's really yeah, cool seeing the cameras, the feedback, exactly yes. what, what is going on. Super nice. It's, yeah. it's really useful. You can uh, monitor topics and also command things, for example, by calling an act, uh, a service. Uh, for example, let's imagine that we have um, this robot available and we can use this teleop display in order to, to control the robot. So... It is really useful okay, so and improve the, the development time. Yeah, so thanks, Andres. Very nice presentation. Let's give you an applause. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so it's time for the questions. Then uh, I have already seen some questions here in the chat, but uh, go ahead and leave your questions for Andres. We are going to do some minutes of Q&A now. So let me start with some of the questions that I have uh, written down myself here. So you, you said at some point, uh, if I don't remember wrong, that for for deciding that something is a hole, the only thing that you are checking is that it has a circular shape. Mm, so okay, yeah. does that mean that if in the image there is something else which has a circular shape, it would be detected as a hole by your model? Okay. In this case, well, 
maybe maybe not because I use a threshold uh, of about point nine or point eighty five. Mm -hmm. So if there is a similar object, maybe the the size and the color is different. So and we can put an example. For example, the the cups of coffee mm -hmm. they are not detected. Uh, but what I tried to mean to to set in that moment was that the features that the Jolo model needs to detect are not too complex. And for that reason, I decided to use a, the small model. Mm -hmm. um, is it clear? Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, is it clear? Also, um, for instance, I have many questions here. I don't know which one to go for. So, okay. I, you said that for for mi maintaining the the end effector orientation fixed, you are using these um, ompel planning constraints, right? So yeah. you are you are not using, for instance, which is something that some other people was using the Cartesian planning. I understand. Ah, okay. No, uh, I'm sorry, my keyboard. <laughs> Let me show you something. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I am using the Cartesian motion planning uh, yeah we see your screen now i have many things here ah, okay it is my presentations okay in about the planning we have the join the space uh planning mm -hmm. uh, planning uh, with using the n effector and the cartesian path planning mm -hmm. A movement with with orientation constraint use the Cartesian path planning okay. and the movement, for example, to the home position or or in the movement or in the moment that the robot rotates around some axis, mm -hmm. uh, it uses the joint space planning. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I see. So now that you are here, let's let's go with a question that I see here from Girish also. Okay. He says, how many planning constraints did you use for your project? Planning constraint. Uh, how many times I... Uh, so which which constraints are you setting exactly? For instance, only one, which is to keep the, the, the end effector in one specific orientation, or are you using some more constraints? Uh, okay, you mean that if I only use the orientation constraint or yeah. I use the box constraint. Yeah. Uh, ah, okay. In my case, I only use the orientation constraint mm -hmm. and I use it um, when I was over the cup, mm -hmm. then in the approach motion, in the retreat motion, and that are two times. And the last time was uh, in the last step where the where the arm moves the cap to the hole mm -hmm. and four and then do the insertion when the cap is inserted for four times okay and all with orientation constraint mm -hmm. okay so um, more questions we have here one uh, question from Miguel Solis, who is going to be presenting in a moment. He says, what was the most challenging part of the project for you? Um, at the beginning was the perception, because uh, let me share the screen. <laughs> because I use the circle jux transform, but You can but you can see here that I got the results in the real environment. Mm -hmm. uh, then I use a um, Jolo and everything was fine. Mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't knew about the but there was another 
big challenge that was uh, understanding how to use the the constraints because the first time I think that I I did it wrong because I had to I tried to planning the end effector and I added there the the message of the constraint and for and therefore the things didn't work. But after understanding how to use the movement with orientation constraint, uh, everything works. So um, mm -hmm. they were two complex things that I found. Mm -hmm. But at the end, they they were solved. Okay, so you, you, you didn't uh, use YOLO from the beginning, right? You were trying no. other approaches, but... I tried yeah. digital image processing. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, so we have some questions now here also related to YOLO. So for instance, hey. um, yeah, Rodrigo is asking, how did you make the whole detection so precise? It seems like it never misses. And Girish also is saying, are you using any specific image processing algorithm that you are using other than YOLO or it's all YOLO? Okay, two questions. Well, uh, um, so y YOLO, YOLO, because it's true that YOLO seems to work very well in the, in the, in the yes. detections. So it was working like this from the beginning or did you have to do some tuning in order to improve no, it? Or? Fortunately, no. Uh, and from my point of view, mm -hmm. it is because uh, the shape is uh, a circle. It's not mm -hmm. so complex. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have to mention that I do that. I did the training with uh, almost um, sixty images, mm -hmm. and uh, with two hundred epochs. Uh, that's uh, related to the question um, mm -hmm. asked by Rodrigo and related to the question uh, Girish asked. Yes, I am using only YOLO. I am not doing a pre-processing. Mm -hmm. pre mm -hmm. Okay, and also I, th I think you mentioned in your presentation that you did the training using images from the simulation. Yes. Uh, not from the real, true. not from the real camera, right? Yes, basically, um, I use synthetic images. Mm -hmm. um, I ran out of time for that reason. I didn't use the the real images that I obtained from the simulation mm -hmm. because uh, the labeling takes some time, and, mm -hmm. but it could be an improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but anyways, it seems that it works okay for yes, the uh, real environment. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Yeah, Girish also is asking something interesting. How long did it take you f to adapt your project for GOG Fox Globe? It, is very com it was very complex, or it, it can be everything set up in a relatively uh, easy and fast way? Yes, it was really fast. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I launched in ROS2 was the bridge, mm -hmm. uh, which is really easy. And the second part was uh, going to the web and adding displays. And it is uh, really easy. It's drag and drop. And you add panels and you only have to specify the topic and well, sometimes add something for visualization uh, that are details, like makeup, something like this. Uh, so um, developing the, the view of the web page I show you uh, took me uh, one hour or one hour. Yeah, that, that's pretty fast, yeah. <laughs> yes. And it helps a lot. It's, it's really useful because also helps you to debug the application. Mm -hmm. Okay, so le let's go with one last question, which I think it's also very interesting. It's from Uday Kumar. 
He says, great presentation. I have a question. So as you mentioned, the pickup location of the cup is fixed and marked with a with black tape. What if the mm -hmm. cup moves or the cup is in other position? What would be a solution for that? I didn't hear the last part after the black tape, sorry. Yeah, he says, what if the cup moves or the cup is in a different position? So okay. what would be a good solution for that problem? Ah, uh, okay. In in that part, would be great if we added to this project uh, another camera and another RGB camera. Let me show this. If here we have an RGB camera, if we have another one here. Uh, I can perform, uh, I can train a uh, cup detection and move the robot arm to the to this point um, without knowing that the point of this uh, position with black tape. So adding more cameras uh, solve, th solve this. Okay, so uh, there are some more questions, but I think we are going to leave it here. I see some a question here because yeah, we have to switch already. I see a question from Read Week and so on, but maybe you can you can contact uh, Andres later and, and yes. uh, make him the you question. Can. Yeah. So uh, yeah, then thanks a lot for your uh, presentation, uh, Andres. Uh, it was really cool, very nice demo also, and. Uh, and yeah, congratulations for your presentation. Thank you. All right, last applause. Okay, then let's switch to the second presentation of today, who is going to be by, bye bye Andres, is going to be by uh, Miguel. So Miguel, can you start sharing your screen, please? Uh, Let me yes. put you here. Hello, everybody. First of all, can you hear me all right, Alberto? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. Sorry, I'm trying... You... Uh, okay. And we see you still here. Let me remove Andres so that we have... Okay, there we go. Okay. So, uh, yes. Um, Miguel is going to present us his project, Robotic. Tacto, perception, intelligence, and manipulation at the service of leisure. So, uh, yeah, the audience is all yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Albert. Um, uh, I would like to open with the following question. What differentiates living creatures from robots? Well, many things, obviously, but for this presentation, I would like to focus on one specific aspect, the ability to play. Mammals, birds, reptiles, and even some invertebrates have evolved mechanisms for play, which constitutes an important aspect of social, physical, and cognitive development. In contrast, the driving force for robotics development in the past decades was precisely the opposite of play, which is work. Robots were designed to automate repetitive tasks that human and decision and efficiency at the same time. However, as you already know, uh, the game has changed. Upgrades in perception devices, the revolution of artificial intelligence, and significant increases in computational power are factors that have enabled robots to move out of factories and start joining other human endeavors. Robots are now used in agriculture, space exploration, healthcare, entertainment, and is this last category what we're focusing on today? So let me, let's talk about the project objectives. The main one is to set up an automated robot arm to play tic-tac-toe against humans. As consequence, among the secondary objectives we find, configure the Movie 2 package for controlling the Mycobot 280 arm, which is the arm that you see in the picture. Implement a perception node to detect the game board and player moves. And finally, create an algorithm to decide the best move based on the board status. As you may know, uh, many robotics projects start with a simulation. 
This is a convenient tool to develop and test robotic solutions with a higher level of confidence. Although the construct provide me, provided me with a gazebo simulation scenario similar to the real setup, I dedicated some time to creating a virtual replica of the board use. This came with two benefits. One, testing my computer vision algorithms with minimal changes expected, and two, helping me to dimension the art movements more accurately. Here is the workflow I used to create custom gazebo models. Using measurements provided by my mentor, I made a 3D model in Autodesk Fusion, exported it to Blender to add material properties, and then exported it again as a Collada file. So Gazebo can use it upon file structure configuration. With the simulation ready, I needed to deal with the arms motion. The preferred tool in the Rust2 ecosystem for this task is the Movie2 package. Since it incorporates features for motion planning, 3D perception, and kinematics, it saves developers a lot of time when dealing with manipulation problems. After configuring the robot to work with this package, I focus on setting up a Rust2 service called Move to coordinates. Uh, that works as follows. Uh, first, it receives three spatial coordinates that tell the arm where to move. Next, an additional parameter called mode indicate what motion to perform at the given coordinates, such as riding across, drawing a circle, or creating the game grid. Finally, the service responds with a Boolean value indicating whether the motion was successful or not. Although Movie 2 is a mature and robust package, I still encountered some challenges with its integration into the project. For example, if I request to draw a cross in the center square, I expect something like what is depicted in the first image. However, I noticed that about 20% of the time, the arm performed unnecessarily long trajectories, as shown in this second image. Uh, this occurs because the motion planning algorithms in Movie 2 are stochastic and sometimes return non-optimal trajectories. The problem with this is that the resulting position could cause errors when attempting to draw a symbol. So, knowing beforehand that switching the planning algorithm does not necessarily fix the issue, I overcame it by planning the trajectory five times and selecting the shortest one. I could afford this solution since I am using the C++ Movie 2 API, and the trajectories are computed quickly. In this way, the chances of executing a long trajectory are actually really low. Changing the subject, uh, let's talk about the computer vision system. I would like to start by discussing the things that didn't work. One of the first things I did was implement a method for recognizing the individual lines that compose the grid. Once I finished, uh, I found that having the information of those lines was of little use to the overall solution. This was an important reminder of not to humanize the problems and not to rush into work. Thinking about how to recognize the symbols, my first attempt was to use template matching. However, after an initial implementation, I discovered that the algorithm was too sensitive to the template size. Additionally, since I had to deal with handwritten symbols, the probability of not matching a template was actually high. Finally, as an AI practitioner, I thought about using neural networks to recognize the symbols. While I still think this is a valid approach, it also seems to be an overkill solution for my problem, since I only need to recognize between grids, crosses, circles, and basically everything else. Okay. And, well, it turns out that my intuition was right. A set of simple heuristics ended up solving the perception problem. Since the board stays in a fixed position, I select just a trapezoidal section for processing. After that, I apply a spatial transformation to rectify the image. Then, we get rid of the color by applying a threshold process. After that, um, some dilation is required to perform component analysis. Just for you to know, uh, a component can be simply defined as a continuous region of white pixels in the image. Identifying the grid then becomes trivial, as it is just the largest component. The last step involves tagging each symbol, but the question still remains, how can we actually do it? The answer relies on checking certain conditions associated with each, 
with each symbol. Here you have an example of the algorithm working in real time with the raw camera input above and the processed output below. The method for identifying each symbol relies on checking that any given component does not contain white pixels in the green section for the circle and in the red section for the cross. If none of those conditions are met, the component is simply discarded as noise in the image. Using this approach, I created the second service server called Getboard State. Upon an empty request, it checks the output of the computed vision algorithm and returns an array of nine values, which can contain um, zero, one, or two, referring to an empty cell, a cross, or a circle, respectively. The server also returns an ASCII representation of the board, which was useful just for debugging purposes. Now, uh, let's talk about intelligence. Since I was familiar with the extensive usage of reinforcement learning in games, at first, I thought it was a good idea to use it to solve the problem of picking the best next move. But after learning about the simplicity and effectiveness of the Minimax algorithm, I decided to choose it as the intelligent solution for this project. The Minimax algorithm is a decision-making tool using AI and game theory. It works by simulating all possible moves in a game, evaluating the outcome of each move, and then choosing the move that maximizes the player's advantage while minimizing the opponent's. In tic-tac-toe, Minimax evaluates each possible board state by considering the best move for the player and the best counter move for the opponent recursively. This way, it ensures that the chosen move leads to the best possible outcome, whether that's winning the game or preventing the opponent from winning. Given the simplicity and finite number of moves in tic-tac-toe, Minimax is particularly effective because it can exhaustively search the entire game tree, guaranteeing an optimal strategy. With this algorithm, I created a third service called Compute Best Move that, given the state of the board, returns three values. The next best move, the player that performs it, and a string used to control the game flow. So far, we have discussed three different ROS2 services, but how do we make them work together? Well, that was precisely the job of the orchestration node which implements a fourth service server and three service clients. The diagram shows a simplified representation of how everything works together. All is put in motion by a main request coming from the make move service. It has a Boolean value uh, to specify if the arm should move intelligently using the Minimax algorithm, or if it should perform a specific move desired by the user. This feature is only necessary if the user does not have physical access to the write, uh, to write on the board, of course. In the case that the manual parameter is true, it becomes necessary to specify an integer value that points to a position on the board. So, one way of playing with the tic-tac-toe robot is through the command line by making ROS2 services requests. Uh, of course, this is acceptable for ROS2 practitioners, but what happens when we want to deploy a robotics application for the general public? Well, in that case, web interfaces are your friend. In the masterclass, uh, we learn how to leverage technologies like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to monitor and interact with ROS applications. For this project, I not only wanted the web interface to be functional, but also to look nice. And that's where the secret sauce comes in, Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a popular open source framework for developing responsive websites. It has pre-designed components like buttons, um, forms, uh, navigation bars, and others. And Bootstrap helps developers to create consistent and visually appealing user interfaces. And here's a free tip for all of you. Well, those, for, all, for those of us who are not web developers, there are plenty of templates online that you can use for free in your projects, such as the one I use here. So make sure to check them out. But be aware 
you still need to uh, to know some basic understanding of how to work with web technologies to to use one of these templates. But don't worry, though. Uh, you will learn everything you need to know if you enroll in the masterclass. So, uh, what's happening with the real robot? The main issue with our project is that the Mycobot 280 arm, being a hobbyist arm, lacks the position accuracy you would find in industrial models. While it's fine for tasks like picking and placing uh, large objects, it is not suitable for precise applications like writing on a board where every millimeter matters. You might wonder, how did the writing tests go? Here's what we found. Keep in mind that the robot was programmed to draw all the symbols at the same height using Cartesian paths. The results clearly show that the arm doesn't have a consistent behavior, making it almost impossible to use it for a tic-tac-toe game in the real life. This serves as a reminder that our code's effectiveness is limited by the hardware cap capabilities. When working with robots, we face extra layers of complexity that aren't typically an issue for other software developers. Now, to close this presentation, I would like to return to where we started. Uh, as we have demonstrated, one aspect that differentiates robots from living creatures is not the capacity for playing, since both can do it. The difference actually lies in the necessity of playing. As ROS packages improve and robotics becomes more accessible to all, the question is no longer if something can be built. The question is now if something should be built. In the future, there will probably be companies making good profits by renting or selling robotic agents to train athletes in different sports. These robots will be like super coaches that adapt to each player's level and will try to make them better by targeting their weaknesses. I believe this is a valid use of robotics technology. But please never become the person in the right image. We humans tend to overestimate our own intelligence, but we will never compete with the ancient wisdom of nature. Playing is a behavior that evolved in living creatures over millions of years, and we still do not know its full implications and importance. There are things that should never be automated, and playing with your loved ones is definitely one of those things. We live in times of rapid technological change, and we will see some weird stuff coming around in the next few years. So my message for you today is to stay diligent and learn to pick carefully what you engage with. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for paying attention. Now we will proceed to do a um, um, simulation demo, and then we will do a, a demo with the real robot. So I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll set everything and I'll be back with you in a moment. Okay, very interesting presentation, very detailed and also yeah, with a very deep message that I hope the audience captures also. Yep, so Okay, yeah, so uh, now we are going to go with, um, with um, as Miguel was saying, with a simulated demo where we are going to replicate a tic-tac-toe game. So if you guys in the audience here in the chat, you can, you can suggest some moves to play and then we, we all the audience and the, ch and the YouTube chat together can play against the, the robot and see if we can beat him. I will be here checking the the chat and passing the movements to Miguel. Okay, thank you very much, Albert. Yes, I don't have access to the chat, so I would highly appreciate that. Yeah. Mm. Also, uh, if you have uh, questions for for Miguel, he has shared a lot of a lot of very interesting uh, information about his project. You can start leaving leaving your questions here in the chat. Okay. 
Rodrigo, Rodrigo says, what a clear presentation and great insights. I felt like I was listening to the David Attenborough of robots. <laughs> okay, so we are getting the simulation ready, right, Miguel? Yes, yes, I'm working on it. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, and I don't trust you. <laughs> I'm, sh I'm sure. Come on, guys. Don't I'm sure that you didn't understand completely everything that Miguel has explained. It. Yeah. So let me let me tell you uh, just in addition to what uh, Miguel said because I have been also testing with him and so on so the um, yeah so this is the first time that we are uh, doing and trying this final project and then uh, the arm as Miguel says has some uh, limitation in the sense that the movements are not precise enough and are not uh, repeatable so the there are some errors in the trajectories, and um, basically the main problem is that uh, the m motions are not replicable. So the, the symbols, for instance, that the robot draws in the, in the um, board are not the same every time, and that is a problem. Also, also because uh, the, the, the besides the is pr this limitation with the hardware, with the arm also, the end effect that we are using in order to to draw in the board is not the uh, best one for the robot. Okay, so this is something that we are going to improve for our next project because uh, because yeah the 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 pencil that we have attached to the end effector of the arm uh, it's uh, a bit improvised let's say and uh, that is also a bit of a problem for for this. So uh, yeah, it's not uh, everything the arms fault, but also um, we need to prepare better the the part of the end effector and 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 basically the part of drawing into the into the into the board. But yeah, so I see that the simulation here is already loaded. So okay, yes, yeah, let's. I'll I'll finish. Uh, I'll I'll finish launching the remaining of the notes. Just give me a second. Mm -hmm. I'll start the web application as well. Okay, everything is launching all right. Okay, so how is how is the game going to go, Miguel? Sh uh, do we start with a movement, or does the robot start? Or I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there are any volunteers already in the chat, but you you guys can pick if you want okay. to start with X or with with circle. So guys, what do you say? Shall we start with X with circle, and where where should we draw it?
anybody has a movement to start with? Okay, we have one movement here. Circle in the bottom right. Okay, perfect. So just to explain you a little bit of the, everything is already set up. Um, just to explain you a little bit of the, of the workflow. The first thing I do uh, when launching this application would be to select a new game. Uh, so I'll just pick that bottom. Let me see that everything is moving all right. So uh, what this button is doing is, first of all, it clears their screen. Basically, the, the real board has a, a little button here that can be pressed to, to erase the, the whole screen. That's the first thing that the robot does. And then it will proceed uh, to draw a grid. So maybe we can have a downwards view so you can see it better, the, the shape of the grid. The simulation is lagging a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think that you you can yeah. see the pattern of the of the movements. Yeah. So now it's like drawing this grid, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in any moment, uh, the grid should spawn. Let me connect here once again. Okay, now that the green has spawned in the gazebo environment, we can see that the vision system is detecting one board. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. So you were telling me that you wanted to play uh, this corner. What's this corner? Circle bottom right. It was the first movement. Okay. Well, the, the first movement is always a, a cross. So we will start with ah, the okay. cross uh, here. Okay, now he's going to the to the attempted position that the user suggested. Okay, now it has drawn the, the shape of an X. We will see that it will spawn in just a few seconds. Okay, now we have an X. Okay, the player is, is using X, so the robot will play circles. Uh, basically, when you want to do a manual uh, manual movement, of, that would be the, the human side, you choose this panel. But when we want to do an intelligent movement, uh, we just simply press next move. So the robot will obtain through the vision system the, the state of the board. Uh, it will use Minimax to compute the best next optimal move and will perform it. So let's uh, let's see what it, what it is doing. It is um, driving, uh, riding the circle in the center. So mm -hmm. let's see how it goes at the spawning. Okay. So where where should we go next? I will go center center bottom X in the center bottom, right? Okay. That's like here. Move. Yeah. Okay. in simulation yeah there it is going okay here's an important moment in the game if I press next move and mm -hmm. the arm does not play here, the, the human will end up winning, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's see how it goes. Yeah, I think robot is not going to allow us to win. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> he has a lot of pride, so he doesn't want to lose. Okay, so we get back here. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so I think I think Miguel that uh, with this is enough. So we can switch to yes. the real robot demo. Yes. Because yes. I see I will because, do. Yeah, I see that yeah. we are already uh, running out of time. So let's switch to okay. the real uh, robot demo. Then I'm going to yes. go there to the robot. And meanwhile okay. you can connect to it and so on. Okay, perfect. Hmm. Can you hear me, Miguel? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I have already connected to the robot. Just for you to know, I can see your, well, the, the main streaming. Yeah, um, now, now I think now it's going to appear. However, I am not sure if um, we are seeing your Roshik screen. No, we just see the um, website. Yeah, the web application. Hmm. I think that we can monitor the game from from this web application because we have we have access to the cameras. Just give me a second to to launch the notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, I basically can see the everything now. Yes. Uh, it seems that we had like a uh, changing lighting. Uh, yeah, no, it, it that is my reflection. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that is my reflection. If I move away, it's going to. It should be okay. Ah, no, yeah, we have some more lighting. Oh, Wait, yeah, I think I turned lights on for. Yeah, yeah. Let me turn them down. So we can see that glare. Yeah, I think now it's there okay. There we go. Okay. Well, basically, Alberto had already drawn like uh, uh, a whole board with, with symbols. We can erase it and start a new game. Yeah, there we go. That's that's my hand, by the way. Yes. So you guys know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me draw. Uh... Okay. Okay. Now we have the grid. So Alberto, do you want to go first? Yeah. Let me write a move. Okay. I'm going to go with uh, 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 an X here in the center. Okay. So right now uh, the game should recognize this X or world the, the board status. And if I play next move to to perform the the robot's motion, it should pick like an intelligent move in any other of the cells. So we will do the demonstration right now. Oh, 
of course, guys, that the army is not going to make contact with the board since we don't want, uh, you know, just to uh, draw messy figures or shapes, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically it played a circle here. Yes. The arm. Hmm. Okay, so Alberto can now play his own move, another yeah. X. I'm going to go here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will just pick uh, next move. Yeah, so it's going to the, yeah, there we see it. The bottom. Yeah. And center. Here. Okay. Okay, then let me try to go. Let me try here. Let's see if I can trick it. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. Uh, I should perform a next move. Okay, you know, I cannot trick it. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbeatable. Yeah. Okay, so then I need I need to draw here. Otherwise, yeah, the the robot will win. I'm screwed. Yes. <sighs> yeah. So basically, the game at this point uh, ends in a draw if the robot draws the circle in the in the left. So let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he wins. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it seems that it let, let me see what what state of the board it got. There it goes. Yeah. Okay. Uh yep. Yeah, so I, was... I Yeah, yeah. I I, I allow it the robot to win. For the sake of the demo, but... yes. <laughs> okay, okay, and yeah, but that was basically the the demo, guys. Uh, thank you for yeah. paying attention, and let's proceed with the questions. I would like to know what do you think about this project, what improvements uh, you should have done, and yeah, let's talk. All right, I am, I am back, back here. here. Okay. So uh, yeah, let me open here the chat to see the questions. I saw already that there were some interesting questions out there. So, okay, here's an interesting one. Given these hardware yeah. constraints, what yes. would you change, physical or software, in order for the robot to try and actually draw? Um, yeah, well, the, the, the main issue, as I was saying in the presentation, is that the Mycobot 280 arm is a hobbyist arm. So uh, it does not have the same precision, for example, that the robot of the Andres project had uh, that we just seen uh, a few minutes ago. So yeah, well, the, the the easy way of solving the project is just changing the arm for a more precise one. Because at the, at the software level, there's nothing much to do if the controllers are not precise. However, I think that we can still uh, uh, try and struggle a bit uh, making uh, other attempts. For example, Alberto was suggesting an interesting um, approach that it would be, uh, I don't know if you're seeing my, my camera, but it would be like allowing some sort of gain between the pencil and the board. So it accounts for the imprecise, imprecise movements. And this game will, will allow to, to, to draw better shapes that are more understandable. But due to constraints in time, uh, we were not allowed to, um, to perform this, um, this solution. But yeah, the hardware here is the main issue. And maybe we can change the end effector, but the most plausible solution would be like having a more precise arm. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, 
let me let me check here. For instance, uh, oof, there are many. Uh, yeah, for instance, Ritwick is asking, could you explain what the orchestration service does and the flow diagram as well in one of your slides with some examples? Ah, sorry, I was muted here and you didn't hear the question. <laughs> no, Miguel, yeah. I didn't hear anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so Ritwick is asking, could you explain what the orchestration service does and the flow di diagram as well in one of your slides with some examples? Okay, let me go through like some sort of request. Um, let me go to the presentation back here. Oops, this the orchestration now. Okay. Uh, let's say for the sake of the example that uh, the... Um, I don't know if you can see my point, uh, my mouse. Uh, let's say for the sake of the example that the movement is not manual. I mean, um, the, the, this will evaluate to false, but uh, here's, here's how everything is triggered. Uh, when we receive like the main request from the web page that I just shown you, um, we create an empty request. This empty request is, is processed by the get board state service. Since it is just operating on vision, on, on the camera input, it does not need any input parameters, of course, and it will return the board state. In this, in this case, the array of nine values representing zero, one, or zero, uh, zero, one or two, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the board state. This is fed to the compute best move. Um, if, you, if you can see clearly here, uh, the output of this um, service is the same as the input of this other one. So this is a more, more complicated uh, service that will compute the best next move. Uh, if you are playing intelligently, um, it would also uh, inform me of the player that should perform this move. This is actually really important because I, I did the project, uh, project to be player agnostic. Uh, the robot uh, will resume any, any match at any given state. It does not hold an internal state of the player that the robot uh, is, is, is performing. So after that, uh, we return the most important parameters are the player and the best move. Uh, the best move, uh, I represented it here uh, as a box, but that would be like some sort of dictionary that maps that move, which is a number, to uh, three spatial coordinates that will indicate the robot arm where to move. The other output parameter that is important is the player. Why? Because the move to coordinate service it uses the mode parameter that um, allows me to draw different shapes or even a grid, depending on the value of this number. And finally, it will return a Boolean value, which is if the arm was able to perform all of this or if something happened. I have like several debugging de mechanisms along the, 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 the process to know exactly what failed if, if something failed. But in essence, that would be like the, the flow of our requests in this project. I don't know if, the, if it was clear or there are any other questions. I think so. Well, we have many questions, but we don't have time. Then let me, let me uh, combine a couple of questions together as the okay. last question. I can see here yes. one from RZ, which I think might be Roberto, who is a, a colleague of us. He says... Okay. Uh, Hi, what is the current success rate for the image recognition? What happens when the recognition fails? And let me add also another question related from Girish down here. Yes. Who says, what would you do to get rid of the glaring effect that was seen on the screen due to temporary bad lighting conditions? Okay. For instance, when I was standing up and things like this. Yes. Okay. For the first question, um, let me see if I have an example. Well, in simulation, is a hundred percent. I have never seen the the system fail in in in, in simulation. However, in the in the real life, uh, Alberto and I did a lot of debugging these past days because we had to change several things. Um, some of them were the lighting conditions. Some of them were the position of the camera, due to uh, to other uh, complications that surge uh, along the project. So yeah, I would say that in a, a clear and controlled environment, um, 
the 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 success rate will be uh, around like 95 percent but since since we we did the changes uh, really recently i cannot give you like an exact number i'm just guessing right now because i would have to actually measure do a lot of tests to give you like a percentage of, of success rate so for this presentation uh, the purpose was uh, of the system to be good enough to to do the presentation but for, for, for a final version of this project, we should definitely do a lot of testing. Uh, regarding the, um, the question from Girish that, that asked me how to, how, to, how to approach those glaring effects, that's kind of an issue because if you remember, I apply a binar binarization in this step. Uh, so yeah, basically if there are glaring effects, that would be... Um, uh, return as noise in the image, like uh, like a region uh, of noise in the image. Uh, on past tests, we found that a little bit of glaring does not affect the system, but too much of glaring definitely um, makes the makes the uh, the computer vision fail. So I uh, I'm open to to hear suggestions. Something I might I might try uh, would be like at the grayscale. Uh, processing step. I used a basic algorithm from OpenCV, but maybe we can use something more complex that accounts for local regions of brightness in the image. So maybe if something is is too too bright, it should compare to 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 the region or of the most close pixels in order to determine uh, um, uh, a convenient value uh, for its grayscale conversion. But yeah, uh, this this goal is definitely a problem in the project. Um, well, the most easy solu easy solution is obviously controlling the lighting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if that answered your question, but are yeah, there any so. other? also also the camera itself, you can you can touch their the brightness parameter to lower yes, it. Yes, and so on. Of that course. would be another solution. Yes. Also from the hardware side, let's say. Okay, yes. so uh, yeah, there are lots of questions, but unfortunately we have to close it here because we have the Rust to Learning Week starting in some minutes. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you can leave the, the you can send the questions directly to Miguel or whatever. Yes. Okay, and uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, super interesting presentation. Uh, I hope super presentations. Yeah, both both of them super uh, interesting. Very well explained, detailed, very clear. So, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Miguel, again, for your presentation. Maybe you Thank can you stop Robert. sharing your screen so yes. that we can see you one last time. There, there we are. All right, so let me give you a last applause. So some, some last words that you want to say? Yeah, no, just reach out with, with your questions if you have any. Uh, yeah, thank you for your, your attendance today, and have a good uh, weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. All right, guys, then, uh, yeah, we are at the end. Uh, thanks for attending. I hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. They were super, super interesting. I hope that they have inspired you to, to do your start your own projects in robotics. And uh, yeah, I will see you in the next final project presentation ceremony, which should be around uh, in a month from now and uh, yeah so see you all in the next one and until then as always keep pushing your robotics learning bye bye